95 degrees Celsius is what this CPU runs at. The AMD at Ryzen 9 7950X when it's using a 360 millimeter liquid cooler for the cooling solution with 100% fan speeds in a 21 degrees Celsius environment. That is very hot. However, it's by design. That's how AMD planned for the 7950X to be used. And in fact, most of Zen 4. And we'll be talking about those CPUs over the next four videos. This one is the AMD Ryzen 9 7950X review, where we'll be looking at the CPU and production workloads, gaming, and power efficiency, as well as power consumption. This is a $700 AMD flagship. It was under that cooler, and it's going up most directly versus Intel's 12900K. We'll also be looking at the $550 12-core 7900X, the $400 8-core 7700X, and the $300 7600X in the next videos. But for now, we're starting with the 7950X. We brought you this video with the GN Store over at store.gamersaccess.net. You can get awesome products like our 3D coaster packs, which include four uniquely designed PC component themed coasters featuring GPU silicon designs, motherboard and CPU socket coasters, a well-balanced PC fan, and a complex GN logo. We're almost out of this design for this pack, and we won't be reordering these designs anytime soon. So grab them while you can, while supporting our testing and independent reviews directly. You should also check out our black and blue wireframe mouse mat, including custom blue rubber underside that's hard to get, blue stitching for anti-fray protection, and PC components and wireframe design like a Finstack, RAM, and more on store.gamersnexus.net. So the new stuff is on Zen 4. It's on motherboards like these. This is an X670E ASRock, but we didn't use this for our review. We instead used an Asus Hero. We'll be using this one for extreme overclocking with liquid nitrogen in the coming days in a live stream. So check back for that. Zen 4 is DDR5 only. So that's a major shift for AMD this generation. We're testing with a Corsair Vengeance kit for this round of tests. It's a very high performing kit, DDR5 6000. It runs 30, 36, 36, 76 for the timings. We ran all Expo timings for AMD and for Intel. Expo, if you're not aware, is AMD's sort of XMP alternative, except it fits more timings in the profiling. And some of the manufacturers are already moving to things like 4 Active Window or TFAW in the timing set for Expo. So this is all good news. If you want to learn more about that aspect of things though, check out our previous video below on the AMD Ryzen news because today we're focused on testing and a whole lot of charts. A couple important notes though. So for testing methodological changes, we've moved to Windows 11 for all of our CPU benchmarks. This is entirely fresh data. All of it was collected within about the last five days or so at GN. So this was a huge team effort and we're really proud of the data we managed to put together in just a few days here. Also, we have a bunch of new games tested. We've moved to DDR5-6000 on Intel Alder Lake also, and uh, basically just made an, a complete overhaul of our testing methods. So, uh, 0604 is the BIOS revision we used on the ASUS Hero. That's gonna be relevant as people may use different versions. There was technically 0605 before launch, but we found 04 to be the most stable. We did have stability issues initially when setting up the Ryzen 7000 system on AM5. AM5 is the new socket. It is, if you're not aware, LGA, not PGA. So that means that it has pins in the socket and pads on the CPU as opposed to pins on the CPU like you saw in older AMD generations. We managed to get past the stability issues though. We had to use BIOS flashback rather than flashing BIOS through the normal methods just in BIOS. So I keep an eye out for stability problems and initial boot problems, but once we got it booted, it was more or less zero problems at all until we socketed a different CPU in, at which point we had the clear CMOS. So a little bit frustrating there. The boot times are in fact long when it's a first boot or a clear CMOS, but otherwise it's pretty standard stuff and stable once we're in the OS. Okay, enough of all that. Let's talk about something really important for this boosting behavior. As we get into the thermals and the frequency charts, boosting is very different this time around. And it's because AMD has designed these CPUs to first hit a thermal limit so it runs at TJ Maxx before it hits a power limit. It's acting kind of like GPUs in this regard, except it's boosting to thermals first. Very different. That means that if you use this cooler or if you use, say, a much smaller 120 millimeter tower or a Noctua cooler, an uh, HD15, or you use a full custom loop, in all scenarios, it will boost on the 7950X to 90 to 95 degrees Celsius. That is expected behavior. Whether or not it's good behavior is a different story, but that's what you should expect to see. And when it does that, the power consumption changes in step with it contingent 
on the thermals. What AMD is doing is adding frequency to the clock for the extra headroom. What that means is that your cooler choice is incredibly important here because the cooler you use will dictate the frequency when it's under auto settings, more so than in the past with just PB2. So uh, let's just look at some of the numbers to explain it. We'll start with the simpler chart. Here's the die temperature during a blender workload. It's actually impressive. The CPU hits 95 degrees Celsius within eight seconds of the workload starting, which is phenomenal considering we're using a 360 millimeter cooler at full fan speeds. Normally, this would indicate a bad mount and we would instantly redo it, but this is actually just expected behavior here. Here's the frequency on the right axis. The CPU is clearly not throttling because otherwise we'd see massive fluctuations in that line or we would see hard tanks downward as a means to control the thermals. Instead, we're seeing immediate 5200 megahertz at the start, which then drops to about 5078 megahertz over steady state. And within the period of most gaming tests that we run, the CPU will be closer to 5100 megahertz. These CPUs don't have just one fixed frequency like CPUs used to have. Instead, the frequency is contingent on thermals now and then power. This is important because when you're looking at reviews today, they're going to have slightly different numbers depending on the cooler they use. It'll all be pretty close, like within 100 megahertz, but that will change the performance. We use the 360 Arctic Liquid Freezer 2. It has the new cold plate on it and it runs at 100% fan speeds in an ambient 21C. So that's all you need to know for our testing. Uh, this is a strong argument for not just closed loop liquid cooling, but maybe even open loop or custom loop at this point where it is a very different environment now. All the parts are going to very high power consumption. Regardless, efficiency becomes irrelevant when all you care about is absolute power draw because that will affect your power supply choice and your cooling solutions. So it's NVIDIA and AMD and Intel, although Intel got there first, all going in that direction now. Here's a bar chart showing all of the exposed thermal sensors on the R9 7950X. These are averaged at steady state after a 20 minute workload. There isn't much IO workload since we're just rendering tiles in Blender. So the IO die runs cool at 41 degrees Celsius in an ambient of about 21 C. L3 is also doing fine. It's not really as taxed here. The T die sensor though, that's the important one. And that shows 95.4 degrees Celsius throughout basically the entirety of the test from the eight second mark to the 30 minute mark. The core to core delta, so that'd be seen from core zero on this chart down to core 15 in the chart is 19.5 degrees Celsius at the highest. That means that there's a lot of room for improvement from lapping here because the coolest cores run in the 70s will highlight one of those and then the hottest ones hit 95. Since this boosts to 95 degrees regardless, the hottest cores are going to be the ones limiting the boost headroom. Dropping them all in a flatter and thinner surface will give more headroom. As for single core frequency during a Cinebench single core workload, it boosts to an exceptionally high 5725 to 5750 megahertz. This chart shows the max frequency for any single core during the test, demonstrating boosting headroom when under a limited workload. Games would be a mix of this chart and the previous one, as they aren't commonly loaded 100% on the CPU. Power consumption testing is next. We're over at the power testing station of the lab. And for this, we're testing at the EPS 12 volt cables, which is before VRM efficiency losses, but it isolates the CPU from basically the entire rest of the system. So we don't have the GPU power or SSDs or anything like that in there. We're looking at basically just the CPU power straight to the CPU. First in Blender, we see the 7950X pull an average of 251 watts when at steady state. That puts the 7950X as one of the highest stock power consumers we've tested yet. The 12900K sits at 244 watts during this workload. And this is the power for both, even after extended use for the full test period. The 7950X sheds a few watts over the test period, but really not much, and only because the CPU is losing some headroom from thermal saturation, both at the IHS level and the cooler level. It's a difference of about eight watts over the test period. The 5950X of last generation pulled 120 watts, marking the 7950X as a doubling of power requirements with a high-end cooler like ours. The 5800X3D was 108 watts and remarkably efficient for what it did. So it's actually higher than the Threadripper 3990X and 3970X, one of which is like a 64 core part. 
pretty up there for power. Of course, it's not all just about the power consumed by the CPU. It's also about making sure your power supply has enough headroom for maximum consumption. Maximum consumption, also a great name for a post-apocalyptic hardcore band, but on the power supply side, it means you need some extra capacity in your power supply as these newer parts come out. So it comes back to efficiency and we do have an efficiency chart for that related to our blender results. Single core power draw is also higher this generation, now at 52 watts for the 750X under a Cinebench R20 one core workload. That makes it more relatable to an FX9590 from the sort of bulldozer era than the R9-3900X or the R9-5950X, which is at 40 watts from all the refinement. Since this CPU is most likely used in a system that's doing a lot more than just gaming, you're probably doing some production workloads also, we'll start there. So we'll be looking at Blender, Adobe Suite, 7-Zip for compression, decompression, power efficiency, and things like that first, and code compile as well. Let's start with the 7950X in some production benchmarks. This test uses Blender 3.3 and the GN logo animation that we built in-house specifically for the CPU tests. Different scenes load CPUs in different ways, and our animation is designed to try and get a balanced load representing the performance, but as always, you're gonna see slightly different numbers depending on what you're rendering. The 7950X is now the chart topper, at least until we add Threadripper back in. The 7950X required six minutes here to complete each frame render, which has a significant 35% improved over the 12900K and about the same for the prior R9-5950X. The uplift over the 10900K, Intel's former 20-thread flagship, is 65% here. The performance gains are real and they're significant, but we should contextualize them with efficiency. The next chart we're showing is for power efficiency. It's new to our test suite. In this one, we're addressing how much power it takes to complete a fixed unit of work. So in this case, the work is one frame rendered. It's the same test on all CPUs, so it doesn't change. The variables are time and power. Even though one CPU is clearly faster, it may consume more power per unit of work completed. This is pretty accurate, but not 100% accurate. For example, we can't easily factor in those 8 watts of power drop on the 7950X over the course of the test. And the 10900K boosts for about 52 seconds at the start, but given the duration, it mostly smooths out. The 5950X is shockingly efficient here and is the efficiency king, even over the 7950X for one frame rendered in our Blender test. It is, however, far more efficient than the 12900K, which is at the bottom of the chart. We think AMD's efficiency claims are overstated, if at least a little bit accurate. It's just that the 7950X consumes so much more power that the efficiency almost becomes a footnote. The next test is for code compile, which we do using Chromium and Windows 11. A lower number is better, as it's measured in minutes to compile. The non-Eco 7950X is the new chart leader at 38 minutes to complete the compile. Compared to the 12900K's 51 minute result, the 7950X can complete the compile in 26% less time. The 5950X required 52 minutes, so it's about the same as the 12900K, but it's far more efficient than Intel's 12900K at half the power for about the same time. If you're on something older, like the 3700X, then the 7950X would give you a time reduction of about 60%, or it would be reduced 76% versus the former Kin AMD R7 1700 Zen 1 CPU. Emphasizing that point, the 7950X is 26% ahead of the 5950X in performance. However, it is double the power consumption for that increase in performance, which is obviously a negative. That is not a positive move for efficiency, no matter how much AMD tells you in its marketing presentations. In this instance, that is in fact a slide backwards. Now, if you were to lock the 7950X to a lower TDP, like with eco mode, then sure it's probably more efficient, but then you're just sort of stifling the CPU's performance where you just paid $700. That doesn't really feel that great. Or if you overclock the 5950X, then yeah, it becomes very inefficient. But stock, it's not really accurate to say that it is more efficient than a 5950X. So uh, it's also why 170 watt TDP is complete bullshit as a TDP number because AMD's TDP formula will show it for you is not based on power. The output is in watts, but the input is not. It's variables that are entirely different. AMD changed the Theta CA on the 7000 series, or thermal resistance versus the previous series, which means none of these numbers are directly comparable. 
They are, you can't draw a line from a 5950X, TDP, 7950X, not the same thing. Just need to look at the actual power consumption. On to compression and decompression testing with 7-Zip. If you use these workloads regularly, this is the section to pay attention to. This is scored as millions of instructions per second, with higher indicating a faster compression or decompression time. In compression, the 7950X scored at 194K MIPS, leading the 5950X in second place by 38.5%. The lead over the Intel 12900K is 41% here, or about 62% over the 12700K. As for the older stuff, the R7 1700's 50,000 MIPS allows the 7950X a lead of about 288%, with a lead over the 10900K former flagship from Intel at 130%. AMD is well positioned thus far, and there's a lot of room between the 5950X and 7950X to accommodate the new CPUs. In decompression, the scaling is more spaced out due to load distribution. Memory and cache get hit differently in compression and decompression, so we sometimes see the results bunch up in compression where they spread out more in decompression. Here, the 7950X completes 279,000 MIPS, which improves on the 5950X's 221,000 MIPS by 26%. That's not as big of an improvement as last time, where we saw the memory and the cache come more to the aid of the 7950X. The lead over the 12900K is massive here, at an 85% uplift versus Intel's flagship, from Intel to AMD. The 1700 allows the 7950X a lead of 300%. So if you're still on Zen 1, this might be the generation to consider an upgrade. The Adobe Suite is next. We'll start with Adobe Premiere, where we test filters, transforms, render speed, live scrubbing, playback, and effects. And then we calculate an overall score in aggregate by using the Puget Bench. The 7950X scored 1189 points aggregating all tests, putting it only 5% ahead of the 12900K here. The CPU difference just isn't making that big of an impact in this software suite, but that's not the first time we've seen Intel and AMD differences converge in Adobe software. If you're a heavy Premiere user, you might not notice a difference between these options. Compared to the 5950X though, the 7950X improves by about 21%. So generationally, that's noteworthy. It's just not as much as we're seeing in some other places, especially when considering the increase in RAM and motherboard cost and power consumption. The Adobe Photoshop test suite is similar in that it aggregates a total score from overall function performance. The 7950X scored 1520 points here, once again about the same as the 12900K. The gap is only 1.6% this time, that's basically error or very close to it, and so the lead over the 12900K just is basically non-existent. The lead over the 5950X is 23%, about the same as we saw before, and compared to the 1700, the 7950X is 118% ahead. But the 1700 is also from the generation that had the biggest disadvantage in Adobe software when compared to the same generation Intel parts. So for production, the Adobe suite doesn't really change very much, but moving on to games, we might see some differences. Uh, it was very difficult to create a bottleneck this time. We moved to an RTX 3090 Ti FTW3 RIP EVGA GPUs, and uh, as the 4080 and 4090 are coming up, this is about the closest we could get currently to what's to come for at least rasterization performance. However, it was very hard to make a CPU bottleneck, which is a different discussion on at what point you exit perhaps sort of the philosophical, let's show differences between CPUs and enter the, but is it reality? But we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's start with a couple of games. Counter-Strike Go at 1080p creates a fully CPU bound workload, allowing us to get a complete picture of scaling. In this one, the 7950X runs at 436 FPS average, which outpaces the 12900K's 375 FPS by 16%. It's a solid start. The 1% lows are also improved, although the 0.1% lows are basically the same. These numbers mostly provide us insight as to when we might need to investigate frame times, but here it's all as expected. Compared to the 5800X3D, the improvement is 27%. As for older flagships, they're in this order. The lead over the 10900K is 60%, with the lead over the 3700X and 10600K a comical 200 FPS average. Anyone jumping ship from Zen 1 would get an uplift of 221% over the R7-1700. So far, a strong start versus the 12900K. 1440p is next. This theoretically would cut off some of the scaling that differentiates the parts, but not in this game. The 7950X is still at about its peak, and the rest of the CPUs hardly move. In the very least, this is a testament to the accuracy of our testing methodology, because they are all nearly identical as before, just with a higher resolution. Rainbow Six Siege gives us the full frame rate range. Here, the 12900K runs at 615 FPS average, 
with lows at 454 and 414. The 7950X drops to 607 FPS average, allowing the 12900K a staggering, unapproachable, and embarrassing lead for AMD of 1.3%. Truly unacceptable. As you all know, Rainbow Six becomes completely unplayable below 615.3 FPS average. And not even a single CPU on this chart is playable. It's an insult to gamers everywhere. Frankly, we can't believe that these companies can even bring themselves to sell such products with a such low frame rates as just 607 FPS. So shame on you, AMD. Far Cry 6 brings us back to more graphically intensive tests. The 7950X actually dips in 0.1% lows in this one, so we'll need to investigate that. The 12900K also has a dip here, but not as extreme. It is, however, related. In either case, the 5800X 3D remains the chart leader by an insignificant margin. Any of the top three CPUs would get you about the same average FPS. This chart is a frame time plot to try and learn what's going on with those lows. Frame time plots give us the most accurate frame to frame depiction of the actual user user experience, because each point on the line is one frame being drawn. Lower is better, but what's more important is being consistent. It'd be better to run a constant 9 milliseconds with fluctuations smaller than 8 milliseconds than to see this, which just spikes from 5 milliseconds to 24 milliseconds on occasion. Now, although at times we can visually see those spikes, it is not game ruining, and the problem stems from Far Cry 6 scheduling in Windows, where high core count CPUs seem to get shafted a little bit by the way Far Cry 6 handles it. So you see that the 12900K, and you see that in the 7950X, but it's not dismal. You can definitely play it, the spikes don't really hurt the experience that much. Shadow of the Tomb Raider won't give us much range compared to CSGO or Rainbow Six, so that'll be a good middle ground test. This one only has a standard deviation of 1.2 to 1.5 FPS, making it remarkably precise for testing. In this one, the 5800X 3D remains the chart leader, although the 7950X is functionally the same in all metrics. The 58X 3D is better value in this specific game between the two, though. The 7950X holds a lead over the 12900K by 5%, so it's not as exciting as CSGO. The lead over the 5950X is 13%, or for an older gen comparison, 128% over the R7-1700. Realistically, almost anything from the top of this chart down till about the 5800X will feel similar. Here's 1440p. This is where we're GPU bound for most of the chart and a good reminder of the limitations of a 3090 Ti with modern CPUs. Even with this card, everything from the 5600X to the 5800X 3D provides a nearly an identical experience. No one can realistically see these differences in this game. $250 gets you the same gameplay as $750, and the 12100F isn't even that far off despite being $100. Not cheaper, just $100. That means this isn't a useful task for a CPU comparison, but it is a useful reminder, and that reminder is that the 7950X is a production class CPU, it's a little overpowered for something like this. F1 2022 gets us back to the ridiculous FPS numbers. The 7950X technically manages to land at the top of this chart, but in reality, it's tied with the 58X 3D. The lows are even measurably better on the X 3D, although not in a way you'd notice. That makes the 7950X's value questionable for gaming, unless you're also planning to use it in production workloads. The lead over the 12900K is 9.6% here, with lows basically identical. So that is a fairly strong gap between the two. The generational jaunt over the 5950X is 17%, also a pretty healthy jump. It moves from 301 to 353. At 1440p, the top gets truncated by 50 FPS by the GPU limitation. This puts everything at and above a 12700KF as about the same, so let's move on. We also tested games like Cyberpunk, Final Fantasy XIV, Total Warhammer 3, GTA, and others, but we were so GPU bound that we have nothing to talk about in those. Those charts are useless for high-end CPU comparisons the way we tested these games, and uh, they become more useful as a teaching tool that, again, you have to really work hard to build CPU-limited bottlenecks for uh, gaming benchmarks these days. Wrapping up then, let's go back through a few numbers quickly. For gaming, it was very hard to make a bottleneck at 1080p, required a 3090 Ti, uh, or exceptionally low settings, and that gets into the debate over 
you know, if you're realistically just going to be playing at 4K or in a GPU bind anyway, at which point basically any CPU from like $300 and up now is going to get you the same experience for the most part if you are GPU bound entirely. So the 40 series will close some of those gaps as you move from a 3090 Ti to something like a 4080 even or a 4090 in theory, but we don't have them yet. They're not out at this point. The largest gaming gains we saw were something like 16% or so versus a 12900K like in Counter-Strike Go. We also saw high FPS and un-GPU bound FPS and things like Rainbow Six, but in everything else there's less of a difference. Now, thermals are extremely interesting for the reasons discussed earlier where, again, it is expected behavior. Saying that a lot, I know, because it is 100% going to be in forums and Reddit all over the place where people are like, is my CPU overheating? Do I have a bad mount? What's wrong? My CPU is defective. It's 95 degrees Celsius. That's normal. Again, Different story on if it's bad or not. AMD, of course, says that this is fine for the CPU. It's uh, designed to run this way and it won't hurt the silicon or the lifespan. Doesn't change the fact that, um, you know, bigger, cooler, better in this instance, which means more money better. Well, that's generally kind of how things work with computers. Also depressingly in life, but for efficiency, it's okay. It's nowhere near what uh, AMD would lead you to believe when you look at something like a 5950X in Chromium or in Blender. So it is in fact behind generationally in the test that we run with the way we calculate it, then say the 5000 series, 5950X, uh, it's still better in terms of performance. It's just that it's taking a lot more power to get that increase and so it's less efficient. So the amount of the units of work produced within the same amount of time is higher on the 7950X, it's just the power is disproportionately higher than that. Now, uh, the 12900K is far worse. The efficiency on that is uh, it's like 250 watts or so, 240, 250. It's a lower performer. So uh, in things like Blender and 100% CPU bound workloads, it is at the bottom of the efficiency chart. Overall, this was an excellent performer in production tests. It had a 35% lead over the 12900K and the 5950X in Blender. It had a 26% lead versus both in Chromium, although the 5950X is at half the power. In compression, it gave the biggest gain at 39% for the 7950X over the 5950X and 41% over the 12900K, and decompression was pretty good also. So performance is good. We think the overclocking enthusiast side will be a lot of fun, but we'll check that out on a live stream. Value, if you're gaming only, is, is not there. This is not meant to be a gaming CPU. You can play games on it. It will mostly do fine. Sometimes it has scheduling issues, but we didn't encounter anything game breaking. Probably there's something out there that would be, just we didn't run into it, uh, at least for the games we use. So if you're playing games only, wait for our other reviews of the 7000 series or maybe even Intel 13th gen. If you're doing production work, this is the best performer we've tested anytime recently in the mini HEDT or not quite HEDT class. HEDT being Threadripper or Intel CPUs that aren't made anymore. If you're looking for basically the best that isn't Threadripper, you don't need a lot of PCIe lanes. Uh, you want PCIe Gen 5 for some reason, maybe for SSDs or I.O., then this is going to get you all of that. It's just you need to have those use cases, otherwise it's a waste of money, clearly, because the motherboard's expensive, RAM's expensive, CPU's expensive. So we're going to look lower down the stack to see where the value is, but this one is at least generationally better, sometimes in pretty big ways, uh, at the cost of extreme power and a much higher cooling requirement. So you're going to need to plan to spend more on your build if you're building with a 7950X. That's it for this review. To support us directly, go to store.gamersaccess.net. This testing took nonstop work from the whole team for the last week or so. So go grab something like a coaster pack. We have a 3D coaster pack that's designed around computer components. It's really unique, custom made, and at super high quality with a great texture and designs on it, like VRM components, GPUs, CPUs, things like that. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help fund us directly in our reporting. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.